Hello everyone, welcome to Market Talks on Cointelegraph. I'm your host Giovanni. Here we discuss the latest news moving the markets as well as valuable insights from industry leaders, traders and influencers. We have a special guest today, his name is Munib Ali. So Munib is the co-founder of Stacks, a Bitcoin layer for smart contract and the CEO of Trust Machines which is building the largest ecosystem of applic for applications for Bitcoin and their underlying technologies. So Munib has been working on internet protocols and distributed system for 15 years and received his PhD in computer science from Princeton University, uh, where he occasionally gives guest lectures as well. So now we're going to play a short video with Munib uh, so that you can understand better his biography. Hey Munib. Hey everyone, how's it going? How are you? I'm great. It's a pleasure to have you on our show. Um, so yeah, I think that uh, we can get straight into the uh, question that uh, I prepared for you. So um, just to get started, um, for people that don't know, for the viewers that don't know, uh, can you explain what it means to build to build on Bitcoin? So we know that uh, a lot of uh, a lot of protocols, a lot of uh, apps are being built on Ethereum and uh, other blockchains, but a few known that this is possible also on Bitcoin. So can you explain how it works? Yeah, so I think most people uh, think of Bitcoin as as a store of value or as money, uh, but but the Bitcoin protocol actually has uh, you know limited uh, programming fun functionality right at the Bitcoin base layer. Uh, so that functionality is uh, fairly limited, like the developers can do certain things, but not the type of kind of like full execution environments or fu fully expressive smart contracts that you see on uh, newer chains like Ethereum and others. And I think that that's, that's actually by design. Like this is how Bitcoin was designed on purpose. The base layer of Bitcoin is supposed to be simple, supposed to be durable, supposed to be very hard to change. And Bitcoin is basically trying to do one thing uh, right and one thing really well, which is being uh, kind of like the store of value uh, that, that uh, everyone can, can use and, and, and benefit from. And then you can build new features uh, around Bitcoin in Bitcoin layers, which are think of that as, you know, new, new types of layers that are built on top of Bitcoin. I think Lightning is a great example of that where it is a, a layer for fast, uh, cheap payments. And people are kind of like, you know, moving their Bitcoin from the Bitcoin base layer. They kind of kind of lock it there, uh, use it in the Lightning channel and then settle back on the Bitcoin base layer. So that's the, 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 the basic concept of layers that instead of trying to change the, the Bitcoin main protocol at the base layer, you introduce new types of functionality as separate layers. And this goes really well with uh, you know, introducing more experimental features or more complicated things. Like with the stacks layer, uh, you have the ability, developers have the ability uh, to program fully expressive smart contracts, meaning that it has a full execution environment. Anything people can build on Ethereum or some of the newer chains like Solana and Avalanche, they can implement that uh, in, a, in a Bitcoin layer. And because stacks is a Bitcoin layer, it is settling all of the transactions on, on Bitcoin as well. And there are very interesting ways where, uh, you know, your, your transaction on the Bitcoin base layer can actually interact with the smart contracts that are running in the, in the Stacks Bitcoin layer. Okay, that, that's fascinating because, of course, Bitcoin can provide uh, maximum security because it's the most decentralized uh, cryptocurrency on Earth. But at the same time, the possibility to build on top of it, it's incredibly fascinating and I'm really curious to see uh, how it's going to play out. So what is the current state of, uh, of, of that? How, how much is being built on Bitcoin at the moment? Yes, I think this is one of the things where a lot of people, uh, just like you said, you know, instantly get the potential uh, opportunities here that hey, this, this could be huge if the true value of Bitcoin can be unlocked, like even in the bear market. Uh, Bitcoin remains the largest asset uh, class. It is around like $400 billion of capital. 
that's mostly just sitting there. And this is pristine capital. Like Bitcoin is uh, the most trusted asset in, in the crypto industry. And right now, it doesn't really get deployed as productive capital. Right? Like Bitcoin gets uh, traded on centralized exchanges like Binance or, or, or Coinbase. But Bitcoin is not trading on decentralized exchanges. Bitcoin is not getting deployed into lending protocols. Bitcoin is not getting deployed into all sorts of like these new applications that are being built. Like for example, NFT marketplaces. NFTs are not trading against against Bitcoin these days. So that's that's the opportunity, and I think people instantly get it when you tell them that hey, all these different applications can be enabled in a decentralized way through Bitcoin layers uh, on on top of Bitcoin. The devil is always in the details. Like you know, when you when you double click, when you go into you know the security properties of these layers, how easy it is to move your Bitcoin from the main chain into a layer and then back out. And so I would say that in general there are I would say four main Bitcoin layers. Lightning is probably the one that most most people know about. Uh, there's RSK and Stacks. Both of them have uh, full execution environments, meaning full smart contracts. And there's Liquid, which is a federated network that right now has only sports for new assets, but they're working on uh, smart contract languages as well. I would say if, even if you combine all the kind of like four major Bitcoin layers uh, and compare it to the rest of the crypto industry, like you know Ethereum smart contracts or, or, or other newer chains, I would say the Bitcoin layers are relatively small right now. And they are at various stages of maturity. Uh, many developers are discovering them. They're kind of like fixing the developer tools and infrastructure, and they're growing slowly. But I think they're reaching a point of maturity, especially last year, I would say, uh, where there's like enough there, enough capital, enough uh, you know really bright teams that are building applications that it's 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 reach, reaching a certain point of maturity. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I think for me, the two of the biggest things that are ongoing, uh, especially for 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 the stacks there. Is one is uh, a trustless Bitcoin peg, meaning that the ability uh, to very easily move your BTC from the main chain into the stacks layer and then out without trusting any custodian, without trusting kind of like any federation uh, uh, type of setups and and so on. So I think that that, that could be a major major unlock uh, in terms of uh, a lot of users who already have Bitcoin being able to kind of like easily move it into a Bitcoin layer and, and then back and, and, and deploying it into applications that way. Yeah, that's, that's super cool. Also, I was, I was talking about that with um, the hedge fund manager, Mark Husko, not long ago, he was making the same point that according to him, it's a bit of a waste to keep Bitcoin just sitting in your heart wallet and not do anything with just hoarding it, just uh, waiting for, for, for the price to go up, of course. A lot of people, the majority, I guess, use it as a store of value. But still, um, if you can use it and deploy it in some sort of uh, uh, financial stack, so using it for for real finance, real finance kind of, you know, lending it out and uh, with all, for all these functions, that uh, would make Bitcoin much more useful and productive uh, as far as I can see. So... Uh, you were mentioning the current market conditions. So what is your overall view of the current market conditions? Yeah, so I think I, um, I got involved with Bitcoin in, in like 2013. So I've seen a couple of these cycles before. And uh, obviously, you know, nobody knows how the future is going to turn out. But uh, at least if you look at how the industry has been maturing, there are these rough like four year cycles. Uh, so 2022 to me feels very similar to like 2018 uh, when the bear markets were just starting. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, these, these markets conditions last for a while, right? Uh, and and uh, that was partially why like, you know, uh, Stacks is a protocol that's open source, you know, decentralized and many people can contribute to it. Uh, we re recently raised capital in a company called Trust Machines. Uh, we raised a $150 million round to kind of like basically build out the largest ecosystem of Bitcoin applications. And one of the reasons uh, to raise a large round is because the uh, the market cycles, right? Like they tend to last between three to four years and you want to have enough capital to be able to build uh, your, your applications or any infrastructure that, that, that needs to be built out over long periods of time, right? So I think in, in that sense, I think crypto is a little bit different where the, the markets are cyclic, and we are at the almost like at the start of a of a beer market right now, uh, in, in my view. 
you said that we are at the start. Did I understand correctly? Yes, I, I think I think we're we're at the start. This might last for uh, for for a couple of years. Okay, that's interesting because there are different opinions in the space. Some people say that next year we're going to see already uh, an upward move in uh, the, Bit the Bitcoin price in anticipation of what will be the halving of 2000 and early 2024. Usually in the months anticipating the, half the halving, we, we, we always see some upward movement. So I guess you, you disagree with that? I think, I think it's possible, but in terms of... Uh, kind of like, you know, getting back into a bull market. Uh, it, it's usually, at least historically, uh, typically the halving of Bitcoin is a triggering event, but the bull markets tend to start some time after that, right? So it might be it might be a little further along. Again, you know, I'm I'm a computer scientist. I, I am not a trader. Uh, I'm, I'm only speaking from kind of like observing the, the previous cycles. Yeah. We'll see, we'll see how it plays out. Of course, the uh, macroeconomic conditions at the moment are not very favorable for crypto assets in general. And so, yeah, it's difficult to envision a bull market uh, in the present conditions. But maybe some short term movements uh, driven by the anticipation of the halving, that's something possible. But we'll see, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. So uh, now we are in a boring market. We've been trading, uh, trading sideways for a while. Um, how, what is your what is your opinion? Is it a good environment for what you do at Stacks for building on top of Bitcoin? What do you think? Yeah, I think I think uh, bear markets have historically always been the best time to build. Like just the level of noise goes down. There are, there are less distractions, and also the type of people who stick around. They're really mission driven, right? So. Uh, when you're hiring engineers and other other folks uh, during, a, during a bull market, it's harder to tell if somebody is driven only because they think there's quick money to be made or versus do they really believe in these technologies and they're doing it because they're intellectually interested in doing that. In times like these, you're actually only going to be surrounded by people who are, who are mostly mission driven, right? And they, uh, they are willing to work on challenging things because they think that this, this is going to make uh, an impact on society down the road. So I think I think this is basically uh, the best time to build. It's easier said than done because a lot of startups around you uh, are kind of like running out of capital or people are kind of giving up on their ideas and moving on and so on. Like, but it's, it's, the, it's the folks who are who survive these times and who actually are able to uh, build really useful things during the bear market. Uh, those are the ones who typically kind of like stand out during during a bull run, right? Like because uh, they're ready, they have actually uh, build out the right products. They have tested out their infrastructure, and they're kind of like ready uh, when more attention from developers and investors and, and users uh, kind of like starts starts to come on, on their products. And I think going back to something you were saying earlier, uh, in terms of like a lot of Bitcoin that is just sitting there, that's one of the largest opportunities in my view uh, that exists in the market. Because if you if you look at a lot of people who hold Bitcoin, uh, they're long term believers and they don't want to sell their Bitcoin. But at the same time, uh, they would like to get access to some liquidity. Like, for example, if they could lock their Bitcoin in a contract and draw some sort of a stablecoin loan against that. That was sort of like the first applications that started taking off on Ethereum as well. People would deploy ETH into a smart contract, uh, get some access to liquidity uh, without selling their ETH. And I think on the Bitcoin side, that that's probably even a larger market, not just because uh, Bitcoin has more capital, because the, the, the community is diehard, right? Like they really don't want to sell their Bitcoin, but they might be willing to lock it if the contracts are uh, secure enough. And I think that's where building the right technologies uh, through Bitcoin layers is very important because Bitcoin has a different culture of uh, how careful people are, how, uh, how, what is the standard uh, of quality and security of, of, of some product that can be used. And we, we saw uh, in, the, in the recent crash that when, uh, you know, these, de uh, these defaults started happening on lending, it was mostly the centralized players that went bankrupt. Uh, the, the, the DeFi protocols actually functioned pretty well. And, and the reason uh, for that is that these, uh, these uh, smart contracts actually have more transparency in the system. More people can assess the risk in a smart contract than in a black box uh, centralized company, right? So if you bring those 
types of uh, applications to Bitcoin as Bitcoin layers, meaning that people can independently see the code, see how secure or unsecure it is, can, can actually make the look at the more transparent system and make a better assessment of like, is this contract worth putting my my capital into uh, for, for either withdrawing like some stable coin or, or lending out your BDC to earn a yield on it. And I think that's that's the sort of thing that maybe goes better with the Bitcoin community, given their belief in decentralization and open systems versus uh, trying to use centralized parties where you have no visibility into how they're doing risk management. And then the, suddenly the company goes, goes bankrupt. That's interesting because I was talking to a chain analysis uh, specialist a few days ago and we were discussing the fact that in 2022, it was actually DeFi protocols that were subjected to the most uh, exploits and, the sec and security problems. So the, most, the, the biggest amount of crypto stolen in 2022 uh, was stolen exactly from uh, DeFi protocols. So you were saying that you would still prefer this system to work on, on decentralized open source code than on, in, on centralized uh, entities. But still, how can you then comment, comment on these numbers? We see that uh, still these open protocols have an issue regarding security. Yeah, so I think, I think that's, a, that's a great point, right? So the way to, the way to think about any uh, interest that you get or, or yield that you get on your Bitcoin is that uh, the, you're getting the yield uh, because of some risk that you're taking. Right. So in the in the centralized company uh, uh, path, the risk is that that company is going bankrupt and you have no visibility into how they're managing, uh, managing their, their books. What they're doing internally is kind of like a black box. Right. So you're you're trusting a centralized party uh, in in the decentralized uh, way or, or in DeFi. Uh, the risk is different. The risk is actually smart contract risk or uh, the risk of a bug in the code that some hacker can exploit, right? It's a different type of a risk. The system is actually more transparent. Uh, it's open source or typically, and, 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 and so the risk profile looks very different. So in terms of like the, the hacks that have happened, I think a lot of the hacks recently actually have been on bridges. Um, and obviously uh, DeFi like, like smart contracts also get, get hacked. But if you look at the blue chip uh, DeFi uh, protocols, like, you know, uh, Maker, or Alwe, uh, the things that have been around for a while, uh, they have been heavily tested, audited, and, and they've slowly kind of like uh, increased the amount of capital that is actually sitting on those contracts. Over time, these contracts become um, uh, more and more secure, right? Because any amount of money that's sitting in a, in a smart contract is an open bug bounty, right? So let's say uh, you, you launch a new contract and there's like, you know, $2 million sitting in it. That's a $2 million potential bug bounty that anyone can come in and try to hack the system. And, and over the years, if it's been a long time and so many people have tried and so much audits have gone, gone on, uh, the, the system actually tends toward becoming more secure. So yes, obviously, if there's a new protocol launches, if they messes something up, you know, uh, fund, funds can get, get hacked from there. But it's the trend line. Like, where are you? Are you trending towards over time? Are you becoming more and more secure uh, and stable? And I think the the open source code and the these contracts they actually trend towards that. And then finally, I would bring up that a, a huge part of that is also the programming languages, right? So on Ethereum, uh, Solidity is typically used, which is a Turing complete language. And and uh, I wouldn't I don't want to get into the details, but at a high level, it becomes very hard to write very secure code uh, in a language like that. Versus if you use uh, something which is called a decidable language, uh, which is Clarity used in the, in the, in the stacks layer, uh, you can actually know in advance all the possible things that the program can actually do. You can have mathematical, uh, you know, formal verifications of what this contract can and cannot do. That's the type of code that is used on uh, airplanes, right? Like, because you cannot take the risk that some software bug is going to cause a plane to crash. So I think these contracts are more like airplanes where once they go live, you absolutely have to make sure that these, these that there isn't a software bug that can cause certain things. And that there are things like former ver verification that you can do that can that can help a lot. You cannot do that with a centralized company, right? Like the, the risk of a centralized company will always remain that it's a black box and and uh, and you don't know what's, what's, what's going on inside it. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. I think that um, as long as soon as we can get 
the code right, then decentralized systems uh, are undoubtedly much better than centralized ones because they are trust trustless. So um, I just wanted to touch upon something that you said. You compared uh, Bitcoin with Ethereum in terms of smart contracts. So can you tell us why is Bitcoin, um, why has Bitcoin the potential to some sort of com compete with Ethereum in the field of uh, decentralized finance and smart contracts? Yeah, I think the way I think about this is um, Bitcoin is better designed for being money. It's very, very simple uh, at, the, at the base layer. And this is something that even kind of like Vitalik admits. I think there was a, a blog post by Vitalik some, some months ago where he's talking about, uh, you know, that Ethereum community at some point would have to make this decision that do you want to be more simple uh, and less experimental uh, and, and be more like money, like, like Bitcoin? Or do you want to be more complex, more experimental uh, to support the smart contract functionality? And I think I think the, the Ethereum uh, uh, project is basically in, in some ways trying to do, be, do both, right? Like they have this narrative of like ultrasound money, uh, and but they're really a smart contract platform with all the complexity uh, that it has. And then they have to make the decision. Like the both things don't go hand in hand, right? Like the, uh, the simplicity and durability of Bitcoin is really well suited for being money. Uh, and at the same time, the downside is that uh, you don't have fully expressive smart contracts. And it's an explicit design choice, right? Like Bitcoin is saying, we are not trying to optimize for being a smart contract platform. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't have Bitcoin layers that are smart contract platforms and they can use Bitcoin as money in them. Right. So that's that's like a, the architecture that's emerging on the Bitcoin side. And interestingly, even on Ethereum, uh, because of uh, scalability, uh, you are seeing these Ethereum layers that are emerging. Uh, they, they could be, you know, roll up uh, based or other types of uh, fraud proof systems like Arbitrum uh, or, or other layers. But in, in different ways, people are building Ethereum layers uh, to have like other types of features or better scalability and so on. So in the end, Ethereum might look like in the future, uh, this system where most of the execution is actually happening in Ethereum layers, right? So that begs the question, then why make the Ethereum base layer uh, so complicated? Uh, why can't it be more simple like Bitcoin if most of the action and most of the applications are in the end going to be built in layers anyway, right? So I think that's, that's, that's obviously I'm in the, in, the, in the school of thought that your base layer should be very, very simple. Whereas Ethereum is in the school of thought where the base layer is a lot more complex. And I think that's where, 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 the, uh, where the difference is. And I think we should uh, recognize the market conditions that right now a lot more developers are in the, in the Ethereum ecosystem. And they put up with, with, any, uh, with these problems like the, your programming language is not that secure or, or you know, other types of issues that they're having because the opportunity space is so large that they're, they're very excited about it. But on the Bitcoin side, I don't think we have fully solved the core infrastructure and developer tooling stuff. I think we're getting there, but we haven't fully unlocked it. So the developers haven't experienced, uh, you know, what building really successful Bitcoin applications really feels like. But I, I think we're, we're getting pretty, pretty close to that. Hmm. So do you think that Bitcoin has a chance to overcome Ethereum in terms of the leader in smart contracts? I think that's that that's our thesis, right? Like we call it the Bitcoin thesis, and the thesis is very simple. the The first part of the thesis is just using the Bitcoin capital, which just makes intuitive sense, right? Like Bitcoin is still the largest uh, capital pool. So if let's say you are building a uh, stable coin, uh, and and you wanted want to back it by a, a crypto asset, a decentralized crypto asset, so a Bitcoin backed stable coin can reach a much higher market cap than a Ethereum-backed stablecoin or a Solana-backed stablecoin. That's just market dynamics. Bitcoin capital, there's much more Bitcoin capital out in the world than anything else. So if you solve the smart contract uh, infrastructure issues, a Bitcoin-backed stablecoin would likely be much larger and much more successful, right? So that's one part of the thesis. The other part of the thesis is that Bitcoin is the best settlement layer meaning that Bitcoin is the most censorship resistant, immutable, durable ledger. So if you're making settlements, like imagine you know, how Lightning works, when you close a channel, you're making a settlement on the Bitcoin chain, and you know that after it gets enough confirmations, 
uh, the probability that someone can come in and actually try to reverse that settlement is very, very, very low, almost impossible, right? And, and that functionality of settlements can actually be used by decentralized applications as well. Let's say I'm registering munib.btc as, as my, my username. Once it's settled and registered on the Bitcoin main chain, I know that people can't just go and change that anymore, right? Versus imagine registering a similar thing on a much smaller blockchain uh, that is using some other consensus mechanism and something fails and people can actually change the history of what happened. So your the Bitcoin as a settlement layer is heavily underutilized right now. And I think as developers uh, start seeing these, these uh, modular architectures where one layer is just performing a very, very basic function, they will start to value Bitcoin's settlement properties a lot more because th that settlement is very, very strong and you can have the rest of the functionality. Uh, even like execution could be in a different layer on, on, on top of Bitcoin. And I think from that lens, like this market could potentially be much, much bigger. And obviously that's, that's kind of like our thesis. We call it the Bitcoin thesis, uh, which basically says that successful experiments uh, in the rest of the crypto industry would eventually gravitate towards Bitcoin and they would use Bitcoin capital and they would use Bitcoin settlement because that, that's a larger market. Hmm. Those were very convincing kind of theses. Um, so you basically would say that the uh, like the success of Ethereum as the most successful uh, settlement layer for um, for smart. I mean, uh, the success of Ethereum in terms of smart contracts so far is just due to the fact that it has the first mover advantage over Bitcoin. But it's just a matter of time that Bitcoin can um, disclose its full potential in that respect. Yeah, I think there's a very interesting dynamic there, right? So there, I think there's certain things that Ethereum did really well. I, I think they really embraced the culture of exper experimentation and focusing on developers. Like if you if you go to a, a Ethereum, uh, you know, uh, like ETH Denver or something like that, you would see the developer culture. A lot of like builders are showing up. They're trying to play around with things. There's a general culture of like you know just supporting experimentation. Like hey, do whatever you want to do. Like great, if, if this experiment fails. You know they're still being encouraging that's a little bit of a, a early silicon valley like culture where you know young startups would always support each other and uh, encourage each other to like build stuff and actually focus on code and and developing things more than anything else if you notice like the bitcoin culture because not a lot of things were getting built around bitcoin i think the culture actually became more about ideas around economics or you know other types of uh, cultural things, if you go to a Bitcoin event, the ratio of like the number of developers versus the number of like non-technical people is sort of off. Not enough developers actually show up. So I think that's one thing uh, which we are hoping to change and it's already changing, that we are seeing more and more technical people, engineers and builders who are getting interested in the Bitcoin ecosystem and, and they're coming in and they're like solving those technical challenges. I think that's critical. If, if somehow I think Bitcoin, uh, would kind of like fail here and not achieve kind of like its potential. I think one of the biggest reasons is going to be the failure to attract engineers and developers and just intellectually curious people who want to come in and actually actually build things. Even newer chains, like when, when newer chains like Avalanche, Solana, they launch, I think they they understand how important developers are and, and, and the companies kind of like behind those ecosystems, they go out of their way to try and attract our developers through hackathons, through trying to fund startups and, and so on. I think Bitcoin has a more organic community. Uh, and and I, I do think that this lack of focus on a builder's culture uh, uh, is something that needs attention. And we are doing a lot of work to, to help that. And there are other Bitcoin companies that are very interested in that as well. So I'm very confident that in the coming years, we'll actually see more uh, like developer focused conferences or events and, and people who are kind of like building Bitcoin application and really celebrating the, the Bitcoin builders culture. Yeah, that, that's a, uh, an awesome idea. I think that, um, I mean, the perception that I have is that Bitcoin, the, the Bitcoin community is a little bit conservative in terms of how they look at Bitcoin. They think that Bitcoin is perfect as it is. And so there is not so much stimulus to make it improved to implement some some improvements so i think that that's a bit of a limitation so far that uh, probably could be bypassed as you are trying to do 
And so hopefully yeah. we'll see something new, new going on. Yeah, I think I think the analogy that I would give there is if you view Bitcoin as TCPIP, TCPIP didn't change that much, right? So the people who believe that TCPIP shouldn't change uh, were right, right? So similarly, uh, the the folks in the Bitcoin community who are like, you know, they reject change or they want to be very careful. I think they're right when that thing is applied to the base layer. The thing that they might get wrong is that you should allow experimentation on top of the base layer because it's not going to impact the base layer, right? If I experiment on top, of, let's say there's an experimental layer um, built on top of Bitcoin, which fails, doesn't matter, right? Like Bitcoin is still Bitcoin and it's doing what, what it's doing. So the other part to realize is that when HTTP was built on top of TCPIP, that's the thing that actually made the internet economy work, right? So when there is a successful Bitcoin layer that has these applications where Bitcoin becomes productive in a secure way, where builders are coming and building lots of businesses, like that HTTP like layer on top of Bitcoin is the thing that's going to make Bitcoin really, really valuable because that's going to expand the total economy uh, of Bitcoin. You, you, back in the days, like people used to talk about building a circular Bitcoin economy. We don't hear of those talks that much because again, a, a normal Bitcoin user can't do much with their Bitcoin wallet today, right? Like they can either transfer Bitcoin or just hold it. And I think in the future, I almost envision Bitcoin wallets where there is a lot more functionality through Bitcoin layers. So let's say your wallet is connected to Lightning or Stacks or some other new Bitcoin layer, and you're swapping to a stable coin directly from your wallet. If you want to play around with NFTs, you can do that directly with, from your Bitcoin wallet or new types of functionality, let's say you want to crowdfund some cause that you care about, you're, you're putting money in some sort of a DAO, like a Bitcoin DAO, uh, and you can do that from your Bitcoin wallet. I think that would actually make Bitcoin more valuable because now there are more things that can be done with BTC, right? So that's, I think that's the, that's the entire argument. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I think that's uh, my final question for you, Munib, uh, would be, uh, a lot of a lot of this is about how to build a new financial system so the purpose of crypto of bitcoin of ethereum as well is building the financial system of the future and so a lot of people are always discussing how this financial system will eventually look like if uh, there is going to be one chain dominating them all or a multi-chain world with different chains interacting with each other so if you can just shortly give us your vision of how that financial system will look like yeah, so I, I, I think that my idea of the future is that um, I think there is going to be a dominant uh, money asset, right? Which I think is going to be, be Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the furthest along for, for being money. I think it is right now not being used as money for online cases, like, you know, trading against NFTs or uh, uh, using decentralized exchanges, but that can change. But in the real world, I think Bitcoin is, is the closest to being used as money versus any any other asset out there. And then I think Bitcoin would get used in Bitcoin layers, but also on other chains. Like you can bridge uh, Bitcoin over to other chains is already happening in different ways. And I think the different other chains would try to specialize uh, in what they're doing, right? So they maybe, maybe there's a system that uh, sacrifices decentralization more for speed. So if people want really fast speeds, they are kind of like giving up on, on, on some decentralization properties, but they're, they're getting those really fast speeds from that chain. Or maybe there's a, there is some ecosystem that uh, uh, specializes more on a specific use case, like maybe gaming. Let's say gaming uh, really takes off on some other chain, or maybe gaming takes on, off on a Bitcoin layer. I think one thing that's uh, a little bit unclear to me is that if Bitcoin layers really take off, uh, does that mean there is less interest in separate chains? Because now you can just plugged into the, the largest capital pool, you can benefit from the largest security layer, uh, but you can build your own uh, independent chain almost like which looks like a Bitcoin layer, right? So that's an open question in my mind. Obviously, we're at a very early stage to even, even think that because first Bitcoin layers need to grow a lot more before, you know, young entrepreneurs, uh, before we reach a place where young entrepreneurs are thinking, hey, it doesn't make sense for me to start a separate chain anymore, right? Like I would much rather start a Bitcoin layer uh, instead of trying to build an independent uh, island somewhere else, right? But at, with that said, right now, I don't see a world where all these other chains kind of like just disappear. 
and there's there's only Bitcoin, right? I think I, I view them as more as um, Bitcoin would be kind of like the largest hub with uh, the most amount of capital, most amount of activity, and connections to some other places, right? And these other uh, places might specialize into into kind of like their own use cases, and and these chains are kind of like interconnected with each other. But uh, but Bitcoin is sort of like the center of gravity. Okay, I like this. Uh, I like your vision. It's uh, not like a maximalist vision, which usually I I don't appreciate too much because it's a little bit too narrow minded. Like maximalists, uh, I prefer I prefer this inclusive vision that you just uh, laid out. So before we uh, wrap up the discussion, I just want to ask you one last question from the audience. So uh, Ralph Hofacker is asking if Stacks is EVM compatible. Yes. So, maybe so Stacks can address is, that question. Yeah, Stacks is not EVM compatible, and it's almost by 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 design uh, because I uh, it's mostly because of the programming language used uh, by by EVM, and that is Solidity. It's a Turing complete language. We wanted to avoid Turing complete languages for security reasons, and we ended up using a decidable language, Clarity, uh, where uh, just think of this way that it gives developers uh, better tools for safety, right? So safety comes before anything else in smart contract languages, I think, right? So uh, Clarity language is heavily optimized for safety and, and people can know even before running a contract that what this contract can and, and it cannot do. And, and so that was the reason to actually not be EVM compatible. With that said, I think there, there are some uh, upcoming proposals in the ecosystem that are there ways to allow some sort of EVM compatibility as a different subnet uh, like imagine not on the on the main layer, uh, but in a in a subsystem, so that people who already have code that they've written that is EVM compatible, they can maybe deploy it and then migrate over uh, to Clarity if that makes sense to them. Um, okay, I think that we have a follow up question here. So, um, this tax domain name, maybe you can uh, tell us about that as well. Yeah, so I think maybe the question is about BNS, uh, which is the Bitcoin uh, name system uh, that has a very interesting history. Like in a way, it actually predates uh, Stacks, the existing system, because it was started on the Bitcoin main chain uh, back in 2015 or so. Right. So in a way, it's actually it predates ENS as well, the Ethereum name system. Uh, and, 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 and the reason why it migrated over to the Stacks layer when, when, the, when the mainnet launch happened is that uh, uh, you, you, there isn't like a lot of functionality on the base layer. And then the transaction fees are also pretty expensive or used to be expensive uh, uh, back, back on Bitcoin. So if you're trying to register, you know, uh, millions of names at some point, uh, you don't want to pay Bitcoin transaction fees at the base layer. You, you probably want to pay cheaper fees in a Bitcoin layer. And then those transactions are just settling on, uh, on Bitcoin. Uh, so I think one of those, um, uh, 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 one one of the uh, sort of these namespaces or TLDs is dot BTC, and that's the one that's actually getting more attention these days. I think they just got listed on OpenSea as well, uh, and they're driving a bunch of interest. But I think there's a very interesting history here that uh, BNS uh, predates uh, the Ethereum name system, which actually started on the Bitcoin main chain, and for scalability reasons, uh, migrated over uh, to the Stacks Bitcoin layer. Uh, when the mainnet launched happened last year. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I think this is a good note to wrap up the discussion on. So I'm really looking forward to see what Stacks is going to be up to in the next months and years and how Bitcoin is going to evolve um, and add some new functionalities on it. So Munib, thanks a lot for joining us to our show. It was a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and thanks to our, to our audience for asking interesting questions and watching us. Um, as always, uh, don't forget to tune in to the show, The Market Talks, every Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. I'm Giovanni, your host, and see you next time.